the Senate, this congressman who frees me the call. Don't stand in the doorway, don't block up the hall. For he that gets hurt will be he who has stalled. There's a battle outside, it's raging. And it'll soon shake your windows and rattle your walls. For the times, they are a changing. So in part one, we discussed the death of Little Walder and Lutton, two people who were dicing the night before. And we began to piece together the previous evening. According to Big Walder, Little Walder went to meet a man who owed him silver. And Big Walder told him not to go alone. In fact, the blood on Big Walder proves that he was there too. And although Big Walder claims a Manderly man was involved, Lutton seems to be the actual man met. After all, we saw him dicing the night before, he's a Dreadfort man, meaning he's more likely to dice with Little Walder than a Manderly man, and he is mysteriously dead after a fight that had nothing to do with him. But Lutton doesn't do much without the say-so of his boss, Ramsey. And Ramsey is a man known for savagely butchering people, which is how Little Walder was found. The evidence really points to Ramsey being the murderer. And accepting Ramsey as the murderer really changes how we see the events at breakfast. Ramsey descending from the dais to the body and his very eager interrogation of Big Walder could be seen as intimidation of Big Walder. What man? Ramsey demanded. Give me his name, point him out to me, boy, and I will make you a cloak of his skin. He never said, my lord, only that he won the coin at dice. The fray boy hesitated. It was some White Harbor men who taught dice. I couldn't say which ones, but it was them. Ramsey was making Big Walder lie. After all, why bring up a cloak of skin? That sounds like much more of a threat than a reward. And the mysterious death of Lutton could be the silencing of a witness. But what we really lack is a motive. Why would Ramsey kill his squire? After all, he liked Little Walder and Little Walder liked him. Well, let's talk about a few other things that don't seem right about the breakfast. First of all, when Hostine enters with Little Walder's body, Fat Walda is silent. This is her nine-year-old little brother and she doesn't make a peep. Yet she screams when Hostine attacks Manderly. Walda should have screamed when Hostine entered earlier. Now earlier, Walda had a look of fear on her face when Ramsey and Roos were arguing. Could this be when she really found out about her little brother's murder? If so, this means that Roos and Ramsey knew about little Walda's death before Hostine's entrance. Another thing that is astoundingly odd is that after the big fight is broken up, Roos, by coincidence, has received a message about the location of Stannis' camp. That seems awfully convenient. The Freys and Manderleys are at each other's throats and Roos just happens to have a reason to eject them? That is some serious luck. But of course, the Raven itself proves that this was no coincidence. Here's its description. Maester Rodri stood behind him, a raven on his arm. The bird's black plumage shone like coal oil in the torchlight. Wet, Theon realized, and his lordship's hand, a parchment. That will be wet as well. The raven and its message were wet, meaning the raven didn't just arrive. It had to have been in Winterfell long enough for the snow on it to melt, but not so long on it for the raven to be dry. Clearly the message arrived long before Hostine's entrance with Little Walder's body. Roose Bolton is clearly putting on an act at breakfast. And frankly, it feels like an act. Roose Bolton never raises his voice, yet here at breakfast he does. Additionally, Roose is yawning when he enters, despite the entire castle being awake for hours awaiting an attack. Why feign like you just woke up, unless you've been up to no good? Could it be that a letter arrived and Roose and Ramsay killed little Walder to create a fray manderly conflict so they had an excuse to send them to war? The castle was crowded and food supplies were dwindling. Everyone was down to eating peas porridge, which means supplies were almost exhausted. After killing Little Walder, all they would have to do is coerce Big Walder into implicating the Manderleys. And it wouldn't be the first time they coerced Big Walder into doing something. He did write that letter to his kin claiming that Ramsay saved all the women and children at Winterfell. There are three big problems with a joint ramsay roos conspiracy though. First of all, had Little Walder been set up to win money at dice the night before, we would have a plan in motion long before the arrival of the Raven. The Raven is wet from the snow melting, but it's not yet dry. Yes, it arrived before Hostine made it to breakfast, but not several hours before. 
Second, having Frey's and Manderley's leave the castle wouldn't require any sort of plan at all. Hostine Frey was eager to leave the castle to attack Stannis. He had actually requested it a couple times, and Manderley as well said he was perfectly willing to leave the castle. No schemes or pretext were necessary at all to get the Freys and Manderleys to leave. Roose simply needed to ask them. And third, if everything was going according to some Roose Ramsay plan, why were Roose and Ramsay arguing? Whatever was going on, Ramsay and Roose were not quite on the same page. There seemed to be a Roose plan, which involved the arrival of the Raven that morning, and then there was a Ramsay plan, which involved the killing of Little Walder that began the night before. And clearly, as shown by the two men arguing, the two plans didn't exactly line up. The two men seem to have their own agendas. And why is that? Well, let's step back and examine what's going on at Winterfell. Winterfell is filled with thousands of soldiers from different houses. We aren't quite sure how many, but Theon notes that when Roose comes back to the north, that he has at least 1,400 Frey soldiers and about 4,000 northerners. Now, Theon reports that these northerners are mostly Dreadfort men, but that's a pretty ambiguous number, anywhere between 2,000 and 4,000. But let's split the difference and say 3,000 Dreadfort men and 1,000 from other northern houses. So Ramsay also brought some additional Dreadfort men, but we don't really know how many. There was a Dreadfort garrison which numbered around 575 at the end of A Clash of Kings. And Arnulf Karstark claims that only about 25 of these guys are now at the Dreadfort, which means Ramsay would have the remainder of 550. But that tale is designed to lure Stannis, so who knows the truth of it. Let's say Ramsay brought an additional 500 men. Now, as I said before, we have 1,400 Freys who are going to be very loyal to Roos as he's married to Fat Walda. Fat Walda, as it happens, intends on her child eventually ruling the Dreadfort. And as we mentioned last time, Fat Walda is a Krakal Frey, meaning Hosteen would likely have a place to crash if he got kicked out of the twins. Not to mention, the Bolted Alliance has arranged the marriage of Rhaegar Frey to Winifred Manderley giving Rhaegar's father, Aenys Frey, a place to crash if he were kicked out of the twins. The point is, Aenys, Hosteen, and their 1,400 men have every reason to be fiercely loyal to Roos. But there are other houses at Winterfell as well. We have the 1,000 or so soldiers that Roos Bolton brought, and about 400 Umbers and 300 Manderleys. Not to mention some Sirwins, Hornwoods, Tallhearts, Dustins, Risewells, Flints, Stouts, Slates, and Locks. It's really difficult to determine how many non-Bolton Northerners are there, but considering House Dustin and likely House Risewell sent off very few soldiers to war, one would think they would each contribute at least as many soldiers as the Umbers. Even if we throw in a measly 50 soldiers for each of the other houses, we get a figure that's approaching 3,000 men. It's a very, very rough estimate, but the larger point is this. The rest of the North combined rivals the Dreadfort forces. And unlike the Freys, these Northerners have every reason to hate the Boltons. They all supposedly lost people at the Red Wedding, and have a number of other grievances against House Bolton, including the treatment of Lady Hornwood, the Sack of Winterfell, and the treatment of Arya Stark. Keep in mind, Lady Dustin and Roger Risewell said this, And Lord Wyman is not the only man who lost kin at your Red Wedding, Frey. Do you imagine Horsebane loves you any better? If you did not hold the Great John, he would pull out your entrails and make you eat them as Lady Hornwood ate her fingers. Flints, Sirwins, Tallhearts, Slates, they all had men with the young wolf. House Risewell too. Even Dustin's out of Barriton. The North remembers Frey. Now it's important to note that Lady Dustin brings all of this up in front of Roose Bolton. And she even brings up Lady Hornwood and her fingers, something that has nothing to do with the Freys and everything to do with the Boltons. And on top of these grievances, none of the other northern houses have been offered anything for their support. Winterfell has been given to Ramsay, and Hornwood has not been awarded to anyone that we hear of. The Freys seem to be getting White Harbor, and they have an heir to the Dreadfort. But the rest of the North is getting nothing. All of this exposes something glaringly off about Roos's actions over breakfast. If one were going to eject someone from Winterfell to decrease the number of mouths to feed, why eject the phrase? Why waste incredibly loyal supporters? Supporters that gives one a serious edge over the rest of the North if they turn on you. Honestly, ejecting anyone besides Dreadfort and Frey men would make sense. Roos is acting seriously against his own best interest. 
Now, you may say, well, Roos had to eject the phrase, they were the ones causing trouble in the morning. Precisely. It was in Roos's best interest to eject disloyal northern houses, but then his hand was forced into ejecting phrase. The Wet Raven shows that Roos planned on ejecting someone that morning. Roos should be ejecting someone like the Dustins and Risewells after their outburst, or the Umbers because of their split loyalty, or honestly, any house that had kin die at the Red Wedding. But Little Walder's death and the resulting fight forced Roos's hand. He had to eject the phrase. And suddenly the argument between Roos and Ramsay becomes clear. It was in Roos's best interest to eject non-Freys and non-Boltons from the castle. But then Ramsay shows up at breakfast with news of the death of Little Walder. Ramsay, if responsible for Little Walder's death, changed Roos's plans. Roos had every reason to be furious. He just lost 1,400 loyal men instead of men with questionable loyalty. But why on earth would Ramsay do that? What does Ramsay have against the phrase? Well, let's again step back and look at what Ramsay wants. Ramsay describes himself as the heir to the Dreadfort. Even after becoming the Lord of Hornwood, he declares himself the heir. He even declares himself the heir during his marriage to Arya Stark. He's becoming the Lord of Winterfell, but for some reason, he still wants the Dreadfort. Now, the Freys clearly believe that the future child of Walda Frey will be heir to the Dreadfort. So we have a bit of a conflict, and Ramsay makes quite a bold statement considering that the Freys were at his wedding. Now, one may ask, why would one even want the Dreadfort when one has either Winterfell or Hornwood? Can't one be happy with that? Well, there does happen to be some problems with both Winterfell and Hornwood. First and foremost, Winterfell has no army left, and Hornwood's is near extinct. But second, neither Hornwood nor Winterfell is secure. The Manderleys still occupy Hornwood, and Winterfell could be claimed by any surviving Stark. After all, Bran and Rickon are still alive, and Ramsay is well aware of this. But even beyond that, Sansa is still alive. Ramsay's claim is pretty darn shaky. But let's focus back on the armies. As Lord of Hornwood, Ramsay would control a very small group of men who would likely hate him for killing Lady Hornwood and wouldn't follow him anyway. As Lord of Winterfell, Ramsay would control even less. As the heir to the Dreadfort, though, he's just a heartbeat away from the largest army in the north. If Ramsay commits patricide, though, he may be able to secure the Dreadfort men, but he'd never be able to secure the Freys. While the Dreadfort men may outnumber the other northerners, they probably don't outnumber the other northerners plus the Freys. And that is why Little Walder needed to die. If Ramsay wants to win the Game of Thrones in the north, he cannot do it with the Freys around. Not only do they threaten his seat at the Dreadfort, but they are the swing army within Winterfell. Ramsay cannot hope to dominate the north with the Freys opposing him. Now there is a lingering question of why this is all coming to head now. Why is Ramsay suddenly working against his father? Well, in actuality, Ramsay seems to have been working against his father for days. Keep in mind, when the Spearwives start murdering people in Winterfell, it is Ramsay who broadcasts that this is happening. It's Ramsay's dogs that find the first dead body, a Risewell man, meaning Ramsay found out first and then let the rest of the castle know. Had Ramsay's dogs not found him, he would have stayed buried for years. And when a flint crossbowman dies, it's Ramsay of all people who declares the cause of death. And when Yellow Dick is found dead, despite Roos wanting to keep the murder quiet, Ramsay himself spreads the rumor of the death. And let's remember that the whole reason for committing these murders was to create chaos among the factions that support Roos. The death set Roos Bolton's lords to quarreling openly in the Great Hall. Ramsay drawing attention to these murders points to him wanting the same ends. But is it really realistic for Ramsay to kill his father and take control of the northern forces? Well, I will say that Winterfell's new stables collapsed under the weight of snow, presumably of the Spearwives' doing. They must have removed a support or something. And the Great Hall, quite notably, has a hastily constructed roof. It seems an easy thing to have that roof collapse and rid Ramsay of all the lords and ladies against him. Now there is one last thing that is curious about the death of Little Walder. His body was found near the ruins of the old keep with the gargoyles. That, as it happens, is where the entrance to the crypts are. Now there are four people in Winterfell who know where the entrance to the crypts are hidden. Theon, Lady Dustin, Big Walder, and Little Walder. So it's a bit curious that Big and Little Walder were in proximity to the entrance. 
I do wonder if Little Walder was revealing to Ramsay the location of the crypts before dying. Of course, we know what are in those crypts, or rather, what are not. There are missing swords that show that Bran and Rickon hid in the crypts of Winterfell and evaded Theon back in A Clash of Kings. And as it happens, Little Walder went on the hunt to search for Bran and Rickon with Theon and Ramsay. He knew the crew lost Bran and Rickon's scent and was having trouble finding them. This makes Little Walder a bit special. He has all of the knowledge necessary to reveal to the people in Winterfell that Bran and Rickon are alive. He knows about the crypt's entrance, and he knows that Theon was having trouble finding Bran and Rickon. So while Little Walder certainly needed to die to get the phrase out of the castle, keeping the secret of Bran and Rickon may have been a secondary motivation for killing him. And that's all on the murder of Little Walder Frey. Once again, I'm probably wrong about half of this, and next time we'll continue on with some more murder mysteries. We will see you then.